Not all remakes are created equal, especially if you ask the people whose work is being remade. From sci-fi icons to slasher legends, here's a look at some stars who had no qualms about trashing the films that dared to try and improve on their originals. The late comic legend Gene Wilder graced countless Hollywood classics during his decades-long career, from Bonnie and Clyde to Blazing Saddles. For many, however, he'll always be the brilliantly eccentric and borderline murderous candy mogul in 1971's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. More than three decades later, Tim Burton decided to bring the Roald Dahl story back to life for a new generation with a new title, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and a new Wonka in Johnny Depp. Sadly, for many of those who had grown up with the original, the two regular partners in crime were deemed to have needlessly messed with perfection. As far as the man who'd assumed the titular role the first time around was concerned, their reboot was nothing short of a travesty. Before the film had even been released, Wilder told The Telegraph, It's just some people sitting around thinking, how can we make some more money? Why else would you remake Willy Wonka? I don't see the point of going back and doing it all over again. Fortunately, Wilder was still able to look on the bright side, saying, Right now, the only thing that does take some of the edge off this for me is that Willy Wonka's name isn't in the title. If Burton and Depp were looking for Wilder's blessing, it would seem that they never got it. You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Lewis Gilbert's 1966 film Alfie is notable for several reasons. It cemented Michael Caine's status as one of Britain's finest leading men. It was the first film to be suggested for mature audiences by the MPAA, and it inspired an American remake starring Jude Law almost 40 years later. Unfortunately, Caine himself wasn't as enthusiastic about that third point as he was about the first two. Although Kane had become friendly with Jude Law during production on Sleuth in 2007, that didn't stop him from giving his true opinions when reviewing Jude Law's performance as the titular Alfie, a cocky womanizer who finally faces consequences for his actions. In a 2009 interview with The Independent, Kane expressed that he thought the newer take on the character was far less self-aware, saying, at the end of the movie, Alfie says, what's it all about? But the minute Jude walks on, you see a young man who knows exactly what everything is all about. Kane also claimed that the remake had far more insidious undertones. It became sinister instead of funny. It just became some guy who doesn't care about women, a male chauvinist pig. But with knowledge, I played an innocent male chauvinist pig. Eyebrows were raised in 2010 when it was revealed that just three years after Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy wrapped up, the webbed superhero would be getting another origin story, only this time with Andrew Garfield in its lead role instead of Tobey Maguire. But following disappointing returns for 2014's The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Peter Parker's cinematic adventures appeared to have come to an end. However, those eyebrows were raised even further just a year after that, when news emerged that Spider-Man would be getting the reboot treatment once again, this time as a major player in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Relative unknown Tom Holland landed the leading role the third time around, teasing the character with a cameo in 2016's Captain America Civil War, before fronting his own standalone film, Spider-Man Homecoming, in 2017. That same year, Kirsten Dunst pretty much spoke for everyone with superhero fatigue during an interview with Marie Claire. Dunst, who portrayed love interest Mary Jane Watson in the three Spider-Man movies of the early 2000s, told the magazine, We made the best ones, so who cares? I'm like, you make it all you want. They're just milking that cow for money. It's so obvious, you know what I mean? That wasn't the first time the star of Melancholia and Marie Antoinette voiced her displeasure with the current trajectory of superhero films. Just a few weeks earlier, the actor had told Variety, Everyone likes our Spider-Man. Come on, am I right or what? Listen, I'd rather be in the first ones than the new ones. Who are you gonna call? Not Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon and company if you're one of the many Ghostbusters fans who deemed their reboot of the 80s classic to be sacrilegious. Yes, the 2016 comedy somehow caused more controversy than the entirety of Lars von Trier's filmography. 
with much of that backlash centred on the fact that director Paul Feig dared to feature, to the shock and horror of thousands, an all-female ghost-busting team. Even the fact that several of the original stars made cameos couldn't appease the disgruntled. One such returnee, Ernie Hudson, even gave the naysayers further ammunition four years later in an interview with Living Life Fearless. The actor said, A reboot to me means you're trying to do the movie over, another version of what we already did, and I think that was a mistake. Hudson, who played Winston Zedmore in the original and Uncle Bill Jenkins more than 30 years later, added, It wasn't a continuation or an extension of, it was somehow a different universe there. You know what I mean? It's kind of like us, but it's us, but not us. Laurie Petty certainly refused to pull any punches with her opinion of Ericsson Kaur's Point Break remake, despite the fact that she hadn't even seen the trailer, let alone the finished film. When asked by a Twitter follower what she felt about the millennial version, the actor responded, Pretty sure it's the dumbest idea in the history of ideas. Bigelow? Keanu? Swayze? Really? Petty, who appeared as Keanu Reeves' love interest, Tyler, in the original 1991 bromance, told The Hollywood Reporter that her disdain for the mere idea of redoing Point Break was so great that her manager gave her a call to ask why she was being so critical. She simply responded, Because that's bullsh**. That's some stupid right there. Critics appear to agree with Petty's assessment upon the film's release. The 2015 reboot, which saw Teresa Palmer take on Petty's role, has a paltry Rotten Tomatoes score of just 11%. Ouch. The classic series The A-Team may have gotten the Hollywood treatment in 2010, but pity the fool who believed that Dirk Benedict would give his seal of approval. Admittedly, the actor who shot to global fame as the charming schemer Templeton Faceman Peck in the 1980 series did agree to make a brief cameo in the big screen adaptation. However, it was a role that he later told Birmingham Live he wishes he'd turned down. You'll miss me if you blink. I kind of regret doing it because it's a non-part. They wanted to be able to say, oh yeah, the original cast are in it. But we're not. It is three seconds. It's kind of insulting. Benedict, who was joined by former co-star Dwight Schultz for his cameo appearance, didn't think much of the film's prospects overall, commenting, quote, they'll screw it up. The A-Team film, which saw Bradley Cooper take over from Benedict, did admittedly divide critics on its release. Although it made its $110 million budget back, 20th Century Fox decided against producing the sequel they had originally planned. Listen, now, I know this is good for the body, but how do you protect the face? Eh, yeah. you don't mess with it, kid. Dirk Benedict isn't the only star who trashed a reboot of their most famous TV series, despite having signed up for a cameo. Pamela Anderson, who briefly reprised her role as lifeguard Captain Casey Jean Parker in the 2017 remake of Baywatch, said three years later that she believes all the slow-motion beach running should have stayed in the past. The actor, who was briefly joined by another former Baywatch legend, creator and star David Hasselhoff in the reboot, remarked, I didn't like it. Let's just keep the bad TV as bad TV. That's what's charming about Baywatch, you know? Trying to make these movies out of television is just messing with it. Anderson also argued that the movie should have taken more cues from the original 90s show, particularly when it came to its budget, adding, $65 million would make a good movie. We made our show for like $500,000. You have the same explosions, the same sequences of water. That's the fun part, being creative. For many children of the 90s, Power Rangers was the ultimate superhero spectacle. After two seasons of tokusatsu-inspired action, the series made the move to the big screen for 1995's imaginatively titled Mighty Morphin Power Rangers – The Movie. Despite the film quadrupling its budget at the box office and a weak sequel in 1997, fans had to wait another 20 years to see the colour-coordinated warriors save the world in cinemas again. Of course, like nearly every superhero movie since Batman Begins, 2017's Power Rangers was a much darker and some would say less fun affair than its source material. Two such detractors were David Yost, who played Blue Ranger Billy Cranston, and Walter Jones, who played Black Ranger Zack Taylor. While Yost called the film as a whole, quote, lackadaisical. 
Jones's issue with the reboot had more to do with the way the Black Ranger was portrayed, specifically the lack of the original Black Ranger's trademark combination of fighting and dance. During a panel at the C2E2 convention, Jones told the audience, Hip Hop Kido was a really important element of who I was on Power Rangers. I think if they would have added that, it would have been awesome. While reboot actors RJ Kyler and Ludi Lin did decent enough jobs in their portrayals of the Blue Ranger and Black Ranger respectively, diehard fans agree that the newer take lacks much of the heart, soul and personality of the original series. From Hakuna Matata to Circle of Life, Elton John and Tim Rice's anthemic soundtrack for 1994's The Lion King was just as instrumental to its success as the animation and voice cast. The pair received three out of five possible Academy Award Best Original Song nods for their efforts, winning for Can You Feel the Love Tonight, while its parent album shifted 10 million copies worldwide. Unfortunately for them, John and Rice were relegated to the roles of executive producers when it came to the music for the 2019 remake. That same year, John told GQ that the remake's mix of covers and new compositions couldn't compare to the original, saying, The magic and joy were lost. The soundtrack hasn't had nearly the same impact in the charts that it had 25 years ago, when it was the best-selling album of the year. The new soundtrack fell out of the charts so quickly. The Rocket Man, who also helped compose the score for The Lion King's Broadway adaptation, also revealed his disappointment at being sidelined the second time around. I wasn't really welcomed or treated with the same level of respect. That makes me extremely sad. I'm so happy that the right spirit for the music lives on with The Lion King stage musical. Home Alone was an unexpected smash hit, making nearly half a billion dollars at the box office and catapulting Macaulay Culkin to international stardom at just 10 years old. The movie was helmed by director Chris Columbus, who would go on to direct further hits in Mrs Doubtfire, Rent and the first two Harry Potter movies. However, it seems unlikely that the filmmaker will be forking out a Disney Plus subscription to see the likes of Keenan Thompson, Pete Holmes and Jojo Rabbit actor Archie Yates in the forthcoming 2022 version of his classic home invasion caper. While promoting another Yuletide family film, The Christmas Chronicles 2, in 2020, Columbus told Insider, Nobody got in touch with me about it, and it's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. What's the point? Columbus, who also took the director's chair for sequel Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, continued, I'm a firm believer that you don't remake films that have had the longevity of Home Alone. You're not going to create lightning in a bottle again. It's just not going to happen. Do your own thing. Even if you fail miserably, at least you have come up with something original. For many loyal Child's Play fans, Don Mancini is as integral to the killer doll franchise as Chucky himself. The man not only penned the screenplays for its first seven installments, he also served as director for three of them. But when MGM United Artists decided it wanted to rescue the murderous redhead from the direct-to-video market, it tasked Tyler Burton-Smith with penning the script and Lars Klevberg with taking the director's chair. The studio did offer Mancini an executive producer credit, but he essentially told them where to shove it. The horror maestro went on the warpath after hearing the news, imploring fans to share disparaging articles about the remake and regularly taking to Twitter to voice his displeasure. During an appearance on the post-mortem podcast hosted by regular Stephen King collaborator Mick Garris, the disgruntled Mancini explained why he'd been left so hurt by the snub. I did create the character and nurture the franchise for three f***ing decades. He also claimed that his executive producer offer on the 2019 movie was a hollow gesture, adding, They just wanted our approval, which I strenuously denied them. It's not just a paycheck, it's very personal. MGM's screwing with that. Fortunately, Mancini's involvement in the franchise is far from over, as his Chucky spin-off TV series is slated to hit the small screen in 2021. You know what they say, you just can't keep a good guy down. Combining futuristic sporting action with social commentary, Rollerball stands alongside classics like Soylent Green and Death Race 2000 as one of the most interesting sci-fi films of the mid-1970s. Unsurprisingly, MGM were hoping to hit another slam dunk, or whatever the Rollerball equivalent is, more than 25 years later by serving up a much more bloodthirsty remake. 
As pre-production for the 2002 version was underway, producers hoped to bring back director Norman Jewison, who had since been nominated for multiple Academy Awards for Moonstruck. To the producers' dismay, Jewison had no interest in returning to former glories, telling the New York Post, I passed on it because it was clear they were embracing the violence that I used in the original to comment on the activities of multinational corporations. The director also revealed that he'd been invited by MGM to a screening, but had little interest in accepting. Die-hard director John McTiernan had no such qualms about embracing violence when he took over the director's chair, although he no doubt now wishes he'd followed Jewison's lead. Indeed, his rollerball remake bombed at the box office and is widely regarded as one of the worst films of the early 21st century. Not only that, but the film got McTiernan in legal trouble, as he served 10 months in prison for hiring a private investigator to wiretap the phones of one of the film's producers. It's not every day you see a movie so bad that the director was sent to jail for it. Joe Pitka may not be a household name, but everyone knows his most popular film, the animated live-action hybrid Michael Jordan vehicle, Space Jam. When asked his opinion on Space Jam, a new legacy which sees LeBron James teaming up with the Looney Tunes' finest to defeat a villainous Al G, played by Don Cheadle, Pitka didn't hold back, telling TMZ that he found it to be, quote, an uninteresting mess. Pitka claimed that it took him five sittings to finish Malcolm D. Lee's glorified Warner Brothers commercial, argued that James didn't hold a candle to Jordan, and insisted that its array of supporting characters lacked the star quality of Charles Barkley, Bill Murray and company. Even the new Bugs Bunny couldn't escape Pitka's wrath, with the filmmaker remarking, He looked like one of those fluffy dolls you buy at an airport gift shop to bring your kid when your business trip has taken too long. Most reviews appeared to align with Pitka's, with A New Legacy's Rotten Tomatoes rating hovering just below the 30% mark. Although the original remains a favourite of many 90s kids, they might be looking at it through rose-coloured glasses, as its critical response wasn't that much better. Its rating stands at just 44%. You wouldn't expect Angela Lansbury, the 90-something voice of Mrs. Potts in Disney's 1991 Beauty and the Beast, to start dissing a movie from the House of Mouse. But the transatlantic national treasure did just that after hearing that Emma Watson would be portraying Belle in a live-action remake of the classic animated musical. Like many of us who grew up watching Disney's animated classics in perfect cartoon form, the Murder, She Wrote star wondered aloud about the necessity of such a project. Lansbury told Entertainment Weekly, I was a bit taken aback, naturally. I thought, why? Why are we doing this over again? I can't understand what they're going to do with it that will be better than what we've already done. It won't be like the cartoon that we did. However, by the time she'd finished answering the question, the actor appeared to have convinced herself that actually it might not be such a bad idea after all. It's one of the famous fairy stories that is known worldwide by children. Therefore, why not? I don't blame them for doing it. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite stars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.